The home chem experiment is over. Home chem is an entire playlist that uh, Grace and I made in 2018 and since then, and it's been part of all the work that we've done so far. It stood for... Chemistry, well, sorry. He says home chem is over, but actually, it's actually a larger project. Home chem is just one part of it. So first, let's go to CIE, which is the overarching project, which stands for Chemistry of Indoor Environments. And that is the overarching project that the Sloan Foundation put together. Now, we have been following these chemists and atmospheric chemists and microbiologists and modelers and like all these interesting scientists who've been working on this grant in three different sessions uh, for about five years now. And most recently, they had their capstone project, which is like a conference where they bring all of their research findings together. And to be clear, this entire project was not so much to find answers, but to find the questions they need to ask. So now all of this research that they've done has provided a whole lot of answers to then build questions from. So this was a 10 year, uh, something close to 30 or $40 million project that involved tons and tons of different researchers from different universities uh, across the globe. And this is partly why we are continue to be so fascinated in our work is because when we got into this, introduced to it, we were kind of getting bored with physics. Physics is just the simple four, three, two, one thing that we talk about. And it's very much home performance. It's the go-to on home performance. So if you follow other building science channels, they're likely talking about physics than when they talk about the theory or the fundamentals and things like that. It's all physics. Yeah, but home performance has now expanded for us because we're looking also at the chemistry and the microbiology behind this. So there were three projects. Um, home Chem, which is the first one that we started filming, about five years ago. House Observations of Microbial and Environmental Chemistry. And then CASA, which was in DC. The first one was in Austin. And the next one was outside of DC at the NIST Test House. And that stands for Chemical Assessment of Surfaces and Air. Mm -hmm. And then the last one was MOKI, which was when they took all of the information basically from CASA uh, and Home Chem and started modeling it and going into those deep dive hypotheticals and running uh, basically the experiments through the knowledge that is already understood. Because the basic is we can't test every single no. home. And so how do we predict what's going to happen? And that's what the, the computer mm -hmm. modeling is all about. So yeah. since Grace got us involved in this, I thought she would be the one who would be best to go to the conference. And so she just got back from the conference and mm -hmm. I have not seen what she is about to talk about. So she's brought her favorite slides from the conference, and now you're gonna talk us through kind of what you learned. Totally, so you've already seen a couple little things, and now this is uh, a picture of all of the scientists that were there participating. Einstein truly was in spirit with us, uh, and quoted a few times. And then I just wanna show you real quickly what was covered. These are the technical sessions that went on to build those answers uh, to make questions. And if you want to nerd out and pause and really look deeply into this, you can. But we are going to, uh, apparently they want our, our channel to host these videos. So we'll actually be releasing these actual presentations on this channel so that you can get, like if you want to go to nerd level 25, that's going to be uh, available. Yeah, and the last thing that you're seeing uh, is about a panel uh, discussion. There were only two panel discussions, and that's actually something that I really hope that we and our channel can kind of continue um, as we move forward, because the next step with understanding all of this is now going into the epidemiological and health outcomes. So we still don't and, know. And we're still not talking about practical applications, because like these guys are atmospheric chemists and microbiologists, they're not builders. So they don't necessarily, they might Right. Right. They but might now, know what's out there. But. but now epidemiologists from like the Centers for Disease Control and UNC Chapel Hill are starting to look at this information and dive deeper with them, um, which again is bringing those answers to create new questions. Mm -hmm. So real quick, this is like the overview and this is kind of what they started out the whole conference with was um, what does it take for high quality indoor air to be achieved? Um, we have, by the way, so I'm looking at this as I think of the five factors 
uh, which again are circulation, capture and filtration, uh, humidity control, dilution air, and pressure relief. These guys, again, are not, they're not coming at it from our particular angle, but it, which is why it's cool that we're able to see in through their window. Mm -hmm. And again, this is totally a video that is just the tip of the iceberg. But you're going to see, we get, it gets into a lot of graphs and a lot of uh, detailed science that I honestly cannot speak to. I am just giving you my impressions, my overview, and things that caught my attention and piqued my curiosity. Um, so, looking at this, it's just amazing <laughs> how, how much we are creating pollution. Um, and these, of these three lessons, I really thought, um, we're looking at ventilation, really, in this project. And how ventilation is a key to having good, healthy indoor air quality. So, what this is saying, lesson one says, ventilation brings outdoor uh, nitrogen dioxide, NO2, or NOx, pollution indoors and stops VOC oxidation from ozone and hydroxyl radical. It stops VOC oxidation. Okay, so it slows down the stuff that's happening inside because of the, uh, the reactive chemicals that we're starting inside. But this bringing uh, NO2 indoors is really interesting. I actually had a client last week mm -hmm. who was saying he was monitoring NO2. I think he was using a Yuhu product. And he said he couldn't figure out where he's like clocked it with cooking. And it's the same whether they're in the house or not in the house for yeah. like a week. So that's kind of interesting. Well, and we'll get to reservoirs later. Um, but also looking at HRVs and ERVs and how they contributed to it as well. Um, and the decay times. Um, that was really interesting. Basically, with um, the sorbent of an HRV you have a faster decay than with um, the ERV, which is more of a minimal VOC partitioning. Actually, it looks like it's, so it's, it's I think it's the opposite. What oh, they're gosh. trying to say is that it takes longer for the HRVs to remove things. I don't understand how that's possible. VOC reversible partitioning to the in, indoors. Outdoor air in, VOC partitioning. I, I, we're going to have to talk more about this, but, <laughs> but, but what it seems like this is saying, and Grace took in two full days of, of presentations like this, what it seems like this is saying somehow is that the VOCs get turned back around in an HRV, but don't get turned back around in an ERV. That, that's right. That is very confusing because HRV cores are made out of metal or plastic, right. and ERV cores are made out of a composite or paper. And that composite and paper has a greater chance of, um, you'd think, a greater chance of catching think. those VOCs as a filter. Um, but, uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm confused. If you're confused and we're on the same page, we'll ask about this with the chemists later. Yeah. Lesson three says, increased ventilation reduces aerosol byproducts from operation of UV disinfection in an odiferous bathroom. <laughs> odiferous. Yes. Um, <laughs> so they, they set up this, all of this. The other thing to remember in the last five years, while they were doing all of this, there was a pandemic. And so people had their grant funding in January to start their experiments in March. And all of a sudden, people couldn't be in buildings. They couldn't be together. So there were some creative solutions happening um, where people literally were running experiments in their own kitchen while they were also teaching their child. <laughs> like, um, and this one ended up, they ended up using a, a bathroom um, at the NIST uh, and compound. The thing to notice here is that uh, UV disinfection creates aerosols uh, as a function of what they do. We don't like that. Aerosols are always bad to breathe. So that's, again, we always are talking about don't put something that's more than a fan and a filter in place. Mm -hmm. They seem to be saying that because a bathroom is going to have a higher humidity, um, that it, it can, that seems kind of, um, commonsensical that it would, yeah. it would reduce the pollution in the bathroom is mm -hmm. basically what they're saying. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, basically, right. but but they're you know discovering formaldehyde, uh, the different VOCs, the fine particulate matter. Like they're just they're looking at all of these chemicals too, and and to Corbett's client's point of discovering NOx in his house, 
this is this is the thing too that the scientists are really looking for. What's even going on chemically in these rooms? Um, so. So dynamics of indoor water soluble organic gases. Yes. These are really so. Like for example, this is something that we learned actually recently, and I'm going to put this into a separate video. But some people have been. I've heard anecdotal evidence that spray foam might off gas things that rots out at the coil of a heat pump or an air conditioner hmm. faster. Like in a couple of years, right. you have to replace your air conditioner because it gets rotten. And I asked some HVAC experts uh, and they said, well, that I don't know about that, but I do know that carbon dioxide, when it, be, it goes into water, because ah. it is a water soluble gas, it becomes carbonic acid. And that for sure can rot out a coil. So if you have too high of a CO2, and then you've got these water films forming, like for example, on an air conditioning coil explicitly, that's what it's there to do, mm -hmm. then you'll have these uh, acid. And, and for those of you who are looking at this slide, you may have already called it, but the indoor amount and the outdoor amount are hugely, hugely different. different. Wow. Hugely different. Um, by the way, one more thing, and by the way, this is gonna be, a, I can already tell, a nerdy, I don't know how many more slides you've got to show us, but like, <laughs> this is gonna be Just a few. potentially rambling. Um, this might end up in a, a video as well, but one of the researchers, Barb Turpin, who's, who was one of the keynoters here, um, said that they measured the PFAS, which is mm. uh, fluorinated chemicals, coming out of an air conditioning condenser, like a condensate drain. They would just put a cup under there and measure Catch it. it. And they found that the, the amount of PFAS that was captured by the wet coil in the summertime was huge. The water coming out of there was like way beyond polluted by the standards of the EPA. They say, oh, we only want this much. And they were getting like four times that much coming out of the condensate. So don't use your condensate water from the air conditioner for gardening <laughs> or for any other practical purpose, uh, in my opinion. Yeah. And also just know when people are like, how do PFAS get in, gets, how does it get into the ground? PFAS is coming off of all kinds of things. And this is part of their uh, study of the pH of homes, which nobody's ever studied before. Nope. Yeah. I mean, nobody's ever studied the microbiome of a home, too. And that's another thing that they're trying home. to map with all of this. It's, yeah. it's very intriguing. Um, okay. This one, I just <laughs> like, you see the big green arrow, and we literally have clients calling us saying, my home, we, we just moved in, we've got these brand new air cleaners and all of a sudden it's smelling funny and my kids are getting sick. And um, so this is scientist, careful language. They, prolific use of chemical disinfectives and reactive processes for air cleaning warrants extreme caution. And just so you guys know, reactive processes has to do with these machines that are actively creating chemistry in your home. So ionizers, UV hydroxyl light. radical creators, UV lights, electronic air cleaners, uh, anything that's not a fan and a filter creates chemistry. It is a chemical reactor. Ask the company who makes them. They'll say, yeah, it's a chemical reactor. And then we clean with these reactive pro products, right. like chlorine and hydroxyl terpenes. radical and terpenes yep. and things like that. And we get the, the kind of chemistry that we're accelerating is potentially super dangerous. For super people. dangerous. But we don't know um, because we haven't asked those questions. I frankly yet. thought Warren's extreme caution was a generous thing to say. Uh, a lot of these scientists actually have had legal action come against them. Um, and for saying more than that. Yeah, but, but um, they're also winning their cases because that's their job to say these things. <laughs> Sticking it to the man. <laughs> okay, um, this, this just, caught me because this is exactly one of the things that we're constantly talking about in an indoor home there's the window there's the paint there's the furniture there's the people and all of these things are interacting and this like very simple diagram i just thought was so great with vocs and dust and part particles um so so a voc is a volatile it means it really wants to be in the gas phase out in the air where you can breathe it an svoc is a little heavier it's it can be in the air in gas phase but it doesn't really want to it'll come out eventually when it feels like so it's a little bit lazier maybe you could say mm -hmm. and so what we've got around the house that is svocs is tons and tons of stuff mm -hmm. and so that that interchange of between surfaces and air is a lot of what casa was about 
Um, and this was one of my favorite <laughs> <laughs> drawings from a scientist. He for he was like, you know what? I'm just going to draw this out because it it's what is happening in my brain. Um, so so I find it very tangible. Uh, the stick figures basically are representing particles having a party, and um, what they've learned is that particles kind of like. They will glom onto things, but they're not very good at holding onto things too. Particles don't have seatbelts. I remember okay. that was one of the big things. Great. And so particles. So the molecules are yes. glomming onto the particle. The particle being the, the ball. Yeah. In this, okay. And then the molecules are whatever happens to be around. Right. And 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 as soon as it like went into the denuder too, it, it they popped off. Um, it, like it took hours to pop off, if I'm not mistaken, when when it would have just taken a couple of minutes too. And so there, that was interesting because it was like, well, are you guys holding on? Are you not holding on? That kind of a thing. Um, I I am just fully going to admit that this was very intriguing, and yet I don't totally understand the science. <laughs> but I wanted to show you this because also the phthalates so um, let from me, indoor let me, surfaces. Let me mm -hmm. read this. Alkanes came riding in on these outdoor particles, okay? Appeared to be locked in even after likely hours indoors. So they're locked to the particles. They don't just come off. Yeah, right there. Should only okay. take minutes. And then phthalates are coming from indoor surfaces and are closer to equilibrium with their particles. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, you know, we're also talking about the phthalates. Coming from vinyl flooring or yeah. composite flooring. You know, we like to think that it's low and it's not like getting up into our breathing um, area. But but the point is, it is. There, these things are moving all around with much more uh, interest than we realize. And I think the thing here also that was pointed out to us at CASA that is going to be in home diagnosis season three is that the ball that you're seeing, this particle, the particle doesn't need to be a piece of dust. Like, you know, you think about seeding a cloud. It's like one piece of whatever, and then a bunch of stuff gloms onto it. It could literally be just the people, which are the molecules. The molecules could get together and form a particle. You don't need a solid piece of anything. You could just have these gas molecules all decide that they want to hang out together, and they all, all of a sudden are a particle. They could be breathed in and then get partitioned into your body. Yeah, and, and I think all of the scientists out there are like, duh. But for the rest of us who sometimes the teachers gave us our answers when we were in chemistry class, uh, it's hard to imagine that. We think that things have to be glommed onto something. It's hard to imagine that the molecules are literally creating particles. And we forget that we live in a fluid. We live fluid. in an ocean of, of yeah. air. Okay, wildfires. We talked a lot about wildfires and they did a lot of studies on wildfires. In fact, um, in Home Diagnosis Season 3, you're going to see them actually running the experiments of having the degraded smoke enter into a house. Um, this is literally after the Marshall Fire. Um, one of the big grantees in uh, the Sloan Chemistry of the Indoor Environments project was um, in Fort Colorado Collins, Bol Boulder. Yeah. Boulder, yeah. So, so that's Nina Vance's team for those who followed along. Um, and this was really interesting for reservoir, understanding reservoirs. And reservoirs are basically things in your home that like grab the VOCs, that grab the contaminants that are coming from the smoke. And, um, and, and then even, give them back off after. Even after cleaning. So, so yeah, you look at the, the bottom graph where the fans activate. And but it then pulls it as, down. And it pulls it down. It's cleaning the air. It's doing a great job. You turn those fans off, and it comes right back. And it took weeks, wow. if not months, um, you know, for these VOCs to really fully be clean. We have a Mitsubishi heat pump that's running in the basement of this house, this is my parents' place, right now that was installed last week, and it's designed to run nonstop. And so we put a MRF 16 filter on it, and I've just got that thing running mm -hmm. all the time. And this is another argument for that kind of nonstop circulation running. It's not energy efficient, but it get, I mean, what it gives you, especially but in risky, Right. Circumstances. Yeah, like, like you know, exposure to wildfire. And, and this house specifically, literally the house is across the street burned down. And so they did not have fire damage, right? Mm -hmm. And yet you can see all of the penetration and, I mean, the windowsill, right, on top of the window. So it's not like the just the bottom, you know, the air leakage came in. You can see it was 
circulating in the house because the top of the windowsill has a whole collection of it. Mm. So yeah, and then it was a bunch of things that you just don't want to have in your breathing, <laughs> have in your living atmosphere. Uh, so that was, that was a fascinating thing. They call them CR boxes to you. And I was like, oh, that's... that's it stands for Corsi Rosenthal. Corsi Rosenthal. We, we call, like to name... Oh, it was I in, just hit that. Sorry. That's okay. It was... It was it's, I think that it was probably a separate idea between Many Rich people. Corsi and, uh, I don't know, Dr. Rosenthal, collaboration that academic, and yeah. then also Neil Comparetto, an, an HVAC uh, contractor. They probably came up with the idea at the same time. Like, yeah. It's not a big Great thing. minds think alike. Exactly. So, but we all, you'll we often hear us boxes. refer to it as a Comparetto box. All right. Um, we are gross. <laughs> This is funny because when we got into this, we got the first certification I got in this field was LEED AP. Uh, I think that's right. Yeah, no, was that it was right? LEED AP. I didn't get it. Well, hers. no, you got I might your have gotten hers. My hers but anyway. You got your hers first. Uh, but then back it then, it was like VOCs were all the rage and talking about like the fact that we got we to gotta cut down on these VOCs mm -hmm. when we skipped the whole fact that people are probably the number one VOC creator mm -hmm. in the home. But nobody wants to talk about that back in the day now, like that we're having this conversation. We could talk about this, but we're, we're disgusting. So what, <laughs> how disgusting are we or what specifically yeah. is the new thing? Right, um, so, so the, the realization is that we are pretty disgusting, um, even when we are trying to be very clean. Um, and oh, our skin is a huge, um, What's the word? Huge reservoir? Is that what you're? Not reservoir. It's a chemistry. It's, experiment. It is literally a chemistry experiment. Our skin releases um, squalene, skin oil, basically, and uh, and then reacts with the water and other chemicals and creates. Where so I'll go to that. In so a second, here they're talking but... about with ozone and without ozone. So without ozone, there's like some some gross stuff going on. But then is this saying that with you if you add ozone? then we get a lot more stuff going on well, coming out of people? And also, yeah, well, interestingly, um, like the more exposure, more skin exposure you have because they have found, um, I'm gonna jump and then we're gonna come back, boom. Because I, I should have put these right back to each other. Um, but basically, skin oil is a sink for ozone. So um, it's a... It's a reservoir. Reservoir, okay. And therefore, we kind of like are creating ozone indoors. By taking it, but we're transporting it. Yes. I taking it, we, we absorb it outdoors. This is actually yeah. like, we, we talk a lot about this too. We're not us, but the researchers that, we, that you'll see in Home Diagnosis Season 3. But they talk about like being in an environment like a nail salon, people who mm. work in nail salons. Mm -hmm. They're there all day and their kid comes after school and they sit there and their clothes and their skin absorbs all the chemicals that are around them. And then they take those home with them and off gas them into the environment at home. And that's why you can get like people who are getting sick from environmental exposure to something that they don't even, they're not even not there. In the environment. It's like third hand smoke. It's the same thing. Yeah. Um, so, that's so this was just kind of interesting that, that literally our, our skin is helping to release ozone into our indoor environment. And mm. we, we all know that ozone, not great, <laughs> a major radical. Um, so what does this mean? And that's one of these answers that is now leading to questions is how much ozone, obviously we're living with a lot of ozone more than we realize it. Now, what levels of ozone is actually causing real significant harm? And that's where the epidemiology comes in. So. This, this reminds me of one other thing that they taught us in the pH department is that some things are water soluble and some things are oil soluble, but they're, you know, it's like, just like in salad dressing, um, they won't be both. And so I wonder if maybe the ozone, I'm just wondering right mm -hmm. now, but like the, maybe the ozone is when it gets into the skin oil, it's kept from reacting mm -hmm. with other stuff for some reason. And honestly, Maybe we need a follow-up conversation with we Charlie Westerler on this one. That, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. He literally did some of the tests with just a tank on his head and no shirt and so cool. <laughs> 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 um, okay, yeah, cleaning, bleach, oh, bleach. Um, again, you, you kind of have to get in on, on all of these graphs and please do, especially if these pique your interest when we start releasing these on the home chem playlist or 
They're already released in the future tense. <laughs> Go check them out. Um, essential oil diffusers. Bad news, man. Yeah, so this, this is funny. The Not scientist, only because it's a pyramid scheme. <laughs> no, the scientist who led this, um, that's his wife's collection of essential oils. <sighs> I, that gave me goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, she no longer has diffusers for those oils, um, and I, I'm not I, I'm not sh sure if she kept them or whatever. And you know, I mean, some people really like perfumes and essential oils, but they are fragrances. They are VOCs. They are things to to just you know not take deep hits. People on. like smells. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Uh, yeah. I felt bad yesterday. We were starting to decorate for Christmas, and I said I, I brought out the projector and put on like uh, the claymation Rudolph for when the kids got home, and and I felt like oh we're not going to give them the experience of being able to smell Christmas, Christmas. food in the house because the way that I uh, run our <laughs> ventilation system is if I can smell what's cooking and I'm standing 20 feet away, you need to turn out the ventilation. So I'm I'm sorry. Okay. But I just think it's funny. Our house smells like clean. It smells like nothing, which is the goal. But also it's like, oh, these people want their house to smell like something. And that's yeah. nice. Yeah. And, and I was re reminded at this conference, actually, that the smell of cinnamon, the artificial cinnamon pine cones and things that you can get at grocery stores and Joann's, etc., those are known carcinogens. So... All right. <laughs> do, just do, do you. Um, this, uh, this talked to, this was an interesting study because they're looking at the different kinds of um, cleaners, basically. These limamine and we're, we're getting into the nitty gritty and words that you would not understand, but like we're talking more about so, like pine saw and. Yeah, pine saw would be pinene. Limonene mm -hmm. would be anything that's lemon uh, scented. Mm -hmm. um, we've got. A mix of pinene and limonene, and then we've got... And they're all terpenes. Yeah, they're all terpenes. Okay. All right. So so basically, this, this is measuring the chemistry, it looks like. Yeah. The well, OH I mean, concentration. Oh, very interesting. Mm -hmm. it's, so it's creating OH radicals. Mm -hmm. OH is hydroxyl radical. It's basically one of the children of ozone that is not a discerning mating partner it just will react with anything that you know has yeah and hcho hcho i don't hydrogen guess. chloride hydrogen oxide why are the h's separate we don't know we're not chemists okay well we can we'll we'll, we'll have a session on that but again like <laughs> These were, uh, the degradation of them was interesting to me. And it looks like one of them specifically mm -hmm. is really, really good. What's the, bl the blue one? Um, no, oh, that it's just is background. the background. Okay, never mind. So, never mind. so that's, that's just the, that would be nothing happening. Nothing. Yeah. Okay, cool. That makes sense. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it really becomes like a whole new education and looking at reading graphs, um, which again, I don't have an education in. Um, so sometimes I feel like I'm flying by the seat of my pants, understanding the X and the Ys. I'm seeing something that's, that's useful. So, mm -hmm. so look at the blue line. Mm -hmm. You can see that the alpha pinene, which is pine sol, basically, um, creates a ton of the OH. Uh, that's, that's the one that spikes the highest on both of the timelines. But then it does the best job with the HCHO. Again, we don't know what that is. I, we, we could look it up, but uh, we'll have a session. Um, <laughs> But anyway, it looks like it'll do one thing. Every, it's everything is pros and cons, side effects. Yeah. Like you get some give and take and you get some, mm -hmm. it's, okay. it's life. So, okay, this, this is definitely for our audience. If you have stayed this long, you are, you are really our audience and we love you so much. <laughs> Thanks for nerding out with us. This is groundbreaking um, next month in December of 2023 in York. And I am hoping York, that, UK, UK, not York, Pennsylvania, though I do love that little town. Um, <laughs> I, I am hoping that we can get over to Great Britain to go film this because this is a super cool test house being built. Okay. One side, as you can see, it's, it's basically two townhome ish homes. I say townhomes because it is connected to another space, but it could also be like a standalone. Um, one is going to be built with normal construction standards. And modern. The, modern, modern, okay. modern, but also yeah. normal. Yeah. 
construction standards. The other one is being built to passive house, high performance technology building. Um, and then the little space in the middle is actually a laboratory. So there are going to be all kinds of things piped in and moved in. And um, so essentially some of the occupancy and um, like in Austin, they actually used real people, but they used them throughout the day, right? Nobody slept in that house through the night. And that's a whole nother question, what chemistry is happening, sleeping. There's some scientists in Germany that I am hoping also, we're just gonna have this Euro trip, <laughs> fingers crossed, to go um, talk with them about this. Uh, but, and then, and then in CASA, at the NIST test house, there were literally like little heat machines that are supposed to represent people, but we make so much more than just heat, which is the thing that we are discovering. Um, so it's going to be really cool to see what happens um, as this house is built and then how they intend to start using it. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Awesome. And basically, uh, that's it. These, these three pictures at the bottom are kind of the group pictures of some of the different modelers, of some of the people who worked on NIST, and some of the people who worked on CASA. So I just wanted to give a huge shout out to all of these amazing scientists. And um, there are, you know, lead principal investigators on it. There are undergraduate students. Like, it just runs the gamut, and they're doing so many cool things. The other, um, the other little graphic of a house this was interesting. They ran all the papers through this word generator that creates art from how many times the words were said. And so as you can see, just really looking at emissions and home chem and the chemistry and hmm. yeah, I thought that that was, that was kind of third hand is quite a big word. Something that we are finding cannabis, another big word. That was another whole study. Hmm. Um, but as you can see, and, and if you, you know, take a little closer look on, on that house of words, there is so much to continue to dive into. So we really appreciate the Sloan Foundation for finding us, for bringing us in. Um, actually, we've got to give a little shout out to Lou Harriman. Lou Harriman who was a big connector in that realm too. And um, we just really appreciate how this has changed our lives and our storytelling and home diagnosis. So again, we'll have those sessions coming soon. I hope um, we're gonna have a lot of stuff for you soon. That's gonna be very high level because season three of Home Diagnosis is coming up. I'm gonna get back to mm -hmm. editing episode four in just a minute here. <laughs> but uh, please do comment below if you have questions. Again, we're probably not able to answer them right now, but we will have answers for you soon. Thank uh, you for your patience in my general scientific education and storytelling attempt to you today. Yes. And, and <laughs> uh, welcome back to us all after a three month hiatus. Thank you very much for staying, staying tuned in on that. Totally. Subscribe if you're not already, uh, so you can keep up with all this stuff. Tune in next time. Bye.